My name is Marilyn Vanderber. I'm an incest survivor. Last week, I was asked to give a very personal talk to survivors and support people. It was videotaped. The tape stopped in the middle. So what you will see, the first half is live, and the second half I will give directly into the camera. It is my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker this evening, a person who not only touched my life in a very deep and personal way, but has also touched tens of thousands of lives across our country, including many in this room. Marilyn Vandiver was crowned Miss America and then graduated from the University of Colorado with Phi Beta Kappa honors. Marilyn chose motivational speaking as her career and was named Outstanding Woman Speaker in America after 30,000 questionnaires were sent to business and civic meeting planners asking whom they considered to be the outstanding speaker. For 16 years, she was the only woman guest lecturer for General Motors. Marilyn's nightmare, worst nightmare came true when she was 53. A newspaper reporter learned she was an incest survivor and the next morning, it was a front page story in the Denver Post. Her millionaire, socially prominent father had started coming into her room at night when she was five. It didn't stop until she was 18. Within weeks, over 3,000 men and women came forward in the greater Denver area for help and support. Marilyn immediately founded an organization called SUN, the Survivor United Network. She contributed to and raised tens of points from survivors who turned to her thousands of sexual abuse survivors to also speak the words many for the first time. During the past 25 years, Marilyn has spoken in over 600 cities. She never leaves the room until men and women have personally said everything they want and need to say to her. She has been in personal contact with more adults sexually violated as children than anyone in America. The culmination of Marilyn's work is her book, Miss America by Day. Of the 1900 books entered, Miss America by Day won a prestigious first place Writer's Digest Award. It is now in its seventh printing and is graded a five star, the highest a book can receive on Amazon. Marilyn spends hours each day responding to survivors. She has answered over 8,000 letters and tens of thousands of emails. Many survivors have written to her on a weekly basis for years. She continues to answer each letter and email until the survivor feels strong enough to move on with their lives. Marilyn's book will be available after dinner, and she is happy to sign an autograph. The book is $20. If that's not comfortable for you, please feel free to donate whatever you can or just take a book. If you already have a book, we kindly ask that you leave the other books for those that may not be able to afford one. There's also a DVD of a different talk that she has given often called Journey of Recovery. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Marilyn Vandiver. I know that you have a very special place right in the center of my heart. Jenny, it was wonderful to get to know you this summer. I have so much pride and respect for you. And Lisa, in the depths of your pain, you just started giving and giving and giving. I'm so happy to have you in my life. Thank you for inviting me. I remember the last time I spoke to Wings, I was leaving the building, and there was a young woman standing there, and she was very shy. So I went over to her and started talking to her. She said, I've never talked to a celebrity before. So, not so much. My, one of my favorite stories is about a woman who was in awe in the presence of a real celebrity. This is a true story. All my stories are true. She was riding through a small community on the East Coast. It was hot, August hot. She saw a small ice cream store. When she went in, she saw four or five tables, only one man seated alone, eating an ice cream sundae. And as he raised his head to look at her, she said, I, I suddenly found myself lost in his light blue, baby blue, crystal clear eyes. It was Paul Newman. <laughs> she froze. He gave a nod. She gave a nod back. <laughs> breathe and walk. Breathe and walk. She managed to place her order. 
And as she was getting ready to leave, she thought, okay, you're not 14, you can do this, just don't gawk. Just turn around and walk out, which she did. Oh, she was so proud of herself when she got to her car. Until she realized she forgot her cone. <laughs> She must have left it in a cone holder thing on the counter. She had to go back. When she went in, she just couldn't help it. She looked right at him and he said, you put it in your purse. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to speak at Wings again. This is my fifth time speaking for Wings. I so hope that I can give comments tonight that will help you in your own recovery. Let's start with the basics. Your family members and friends say, why are you still talking about this? This happened decades ago. You need to move on with your life. Just get over it. Bill Cosby was on trial this summer. Ten jurors found him guilty. Two jurors found him not guilty. It had to be unanimous. One of the judges who found him not guilty said, she didn't report it for over a year. If it really happened, she would have reported it immediately. I certainly would have. And so he found him not guilty. Most of us are between the ages of 40 and 50 when we first disclose. Ronald Reagan's son, Michael, was sexually assaulted again and again by a camp counselor when he was eight, a second grader. One day the counselor told him to take off all his clothes and when he resisted, the counselor took his clothes off and then stepped back and took pictures of the naked little boy. A few days later, he showed the pictures to Michael and said, wouldn't your dad just love to see these pictures? He said, I hated myself. By the time I was eight, Michael grew into his manhood, believing today would be the day his picture would be on the cover of a tabloid under the sentence, Ronald Reagan's son, and then everyone would know. He said, I lived in hell for 35 years. I didn't tell anyone until my father was the president of the United States, and I just couldn't hold it in anymore. He was 43. Oprah was nine when she was raped by her 19-year-old cousin. She didn't tell anyone for 30 years. The person she told blamed her. She said, I was 42 before I understood. It was not my fault. When Mary Tyler Moore told her parents that their best friend had sexually molested her, her mother said, it didn't happen. She didn't speak of it again until she was 45. When Margot Hemingway told her parents that her godfather was sexually molesting her, they stopped speaking to her. She committed suicide when she was 41. Of course, not all of us are between the ages of 40 and 50 when we first disclose. I have a website, so anyone can email me. A woman wrote, I'm a hospice worker in New Jersey. Last night, a 94-year-old woman asked me to come sit on her bed. She wanted to tell me something. Slowly, hauntingly, she said, I need to tell you something. I have never been able to tell anyone when I was seven, I was sexually molested by my cousin, and I had to tell someone. 
before I die. I was 53 before I was able to say the ugliest six-letter word in the English language. The word is incest. I was an incest victim from age 5 to age 18. If my father came into my room one night a week for 13 years, that's over 600 times. I don't remember how often as a child. I know as a teenager. It was more often than that. So many of you have heard me speak, or you've watched an interview, or you've read my book. So tonight, I'm not going to talk about what I usually talk about. My mother, my father, my youth minister, Dee Dee Harvey, my husband, Larry, or our daughter, Jennifer. Tonight, I'm going to share experiences I would never share in public. Some of the experiences are difficult for me to share and may be difficult for you to hear. I take a risk. I'm concerned that I will trigger you. I take this risk only because this is a wings gathering, because there are therapists here, and because I will stay after to talk to anyone who wants to talk with me. If you have never been raped or sexually assaulted, you may find the impact on my life unbelievable. Survivors will understand. Although each of us walks a different path, we share the same feelings. Many survivors email me four to five times a day as they struggle just to survive. I didn't even know there was a word for what I was experiencing as an adult. Freud called it hysteria. Others call it a complete nervous breakdown. The word is recovery. And recovery is a normal, predictable process. I didn't know that. Many survivors don't know that. As adults, we have to go back and relive the memories as if it's happening to us in real time. And we have to go back and feel the feelings of overwhelming shame, humiliation, degradation. Because when we bury feelings alive, they just sit there until something triggers them. Nothing about our childhood changes. We change our lives by changing our beliefs. We change our lives by changing our beliefs. As a child, much more difficult as a teenager, I always pretended to be asleep. I tried so hard to not move. My father did anything he could think of to make my body respond, and I tried so hard to not feel. Some nights, my father won. I have no words to describe the shame I felt about that. Although I don't remember this, I believe as a child, I struck a deal. I said, you stay in the bedroom and take all this, and I'll go out and be successful. And then I'll come back and get you. The problem was, when I became successful, not only did I not go back and get her, I hated her with every ounce of my being. I have never hated anyone or anything as much as I hated my night child. She was bad, dirty, ugly, 
unlovable and guilty. It was a core belief. I was bad. I don't know how many core beliefs we have. I was on a plane Tuesday. There was a woman sitting next to me who was reading a book on Christianity, and a young man sitting next to her who was an atheist. And they were having a conversation, and she was, he was trying to convince her not to believe in God. Well, there was nothing that he could say or do that was going to change her core belief in God. My therapist said, I could not heal unless I integrated the night child, unless I found compassion for her and embraced her. Well, that was not going to happen. Not a chance. Therapy session after therapy session. Can you go to your room and comfort your night child? No, I can't. I was given a meditation cassette. You're supposed to take what's bothering you, put it in a big, heavy box, wrap it in chains, and dump it in the ocean. I could do that. I just put my night child in there. Right. In therapy, we talk about it, talk about it, and talk about it. Can you go to your room and comfort your night child? She was a precious child. It was not your fault. I knew I had to change my beliefs. I just didn't know how. One day a therapist said to me, do you know anything about bioenergetics? I didn't. So I went to the tattered cover and I said, do you have any books on bioenergetics? And she said, that section, Dr. Alexander Lowen, who had studied under William Reich, who had studied under Freud, had written 13 books and there were multiple copies. I bought a book and I scurried home and I went back to my bedroom and I started reading. And then I started crying. He knows me. He knows that my skin screams. He knows that I feel an axe embedded in my body, finally. Somebody knows me. I went back to the tattered cover and I bought two more books. At the end of every book, it said Bioenergetic Center in New York City. I called the number. And I said, did Dr. Lowen train anyone? And she said, no. But as we talked, I had a sense he was still living. I said, is Dr. Lowen still living? And she said, yes, but he's 80. And he's not seeing any new patients. <laughs> oh, she had never met me. <laughs> I wrote him a letter, and he wrote back, and I flew to New York. I got all of his books. I knew all of the exercises. He said, I'm going to stand behind, you're going to sit in a straight back chair, and I'm going to stand behind you, and I'm going to start hitting you. And all you have to do to stop me is to say stop or raise a finger. If you do not say stop or raise your finger, I will continue hitting you. And I will hurt you. Do you understand? I understood. He began hitting me harder and harder. It hurt. And finally my body just collapsed. And I heard myself say in a child's voice, I just have to take it. My night child wasn't big and strong. 
and she had no power. She just had to take it for 13 years. It was the first time I felt compassion for the child I was. I could not find her in talk therapy. I had to get in to my body. Later that year, my therapist asked if I would consider going to self-defense classes. Oh, just the idea was just overwhelming. But I wanted to get better. It was a neighborhood gathering. There were nine women. All of us had been raped or sexually assaulted, but no one talked about it. The instructor said she would teach us how to defend ourselves, and then the seventh week, the man would come, and we would defend ourselves against our rapist, our perpetrator. I actually loved the classes, although, although, well, the move I loved best was when she came right at me and put her arms around me. I was to lift my arms quickly to break her hold, and then I was take, to take my knee, I was told he would be wearing protection, and ram his balls to his eye sockets. <laughs> oh, I love that move. I wanted to ram his balls to his eye sockets. I loved ramming. <laughs> the seventh week, the man came. I knew what he would look like big and mean and gruff, I was ready. Greg walked in. His girlfriend had been raped, and he wanted to help empower other women. He was handsome and clean soft. I don't remember anything until I heard the instructor say, Marilyn, Marilyn, it's your turn now. Everyone else has gone. I walked almost robotically and he put his arms around me. I knew exactly what to do. Bring my arms up and bring All I wanted to do was hold him. I wanted to hold him more than I have ever wanted anything in my life. I need to ram him. I want to hold him. I froze. I heard the instructor say, Marilyn. <clears throat> Marilyn, open your eyes. Open your eyes. We'll take a break now. The women went and sat in a circle to talk about their feelings. I sat down for about two seconds, and then I got up, and I started wandering through the building. I wanted to find Greg. I found him. He was in a room studying, and I said, would you hold me? He said, of course. And he put his arms around me, and I put my arms around him, and I sobbed, and I sobbed, and I sobbed, and I said, thank you. And I went back to the circle. I sat down for about two seconds, and then I got up again, and I went back to Greg, and I said, would you hold me again? And I sobbed, and I sobbed. And then he said, did this happen recently? Oh. I wasn't mine, and this wasn't my father. But for the first time, I knew what the child in me had wanted so desperately. Just a father to hold her with no moving fingers. 
I believe that my child was big and brave, and I blamed her unmercifully for not fighting back, for not shouting no, for not standing up to him. I could find no compassion for her until I could feel what she had longed for, just to be loved. During my six years in therapy, the biggest changes came when I got into my body. My session with Dr. Lowen took me back to how I felt as a child, powerless. I had been groomed and conditioned. And self-defense also took me back to how I felt. I just wanted to be loved. I could not get there in talk therapy. I had to get into my body to begin to feel compassion for the child I was. Survivors asked me about body pain. My body felt like piano wire that had been tightened and tightened and tightened. When my father said, just go with it, I tightened my body even more. Now, as an adult, my body felt like a prison. My body pain was so overwhelming and unrelenting, I checked myself into the psychiatric ward, Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles. It did not help. I came back to Denver. I heard about a therapist. I don't remember much about him. I remember he was tall, and for some reason we were standing talking to one another. And he said, are you sure you want to let your body tightness go? And in my head I'm saying yes, but that's not what I said. I dropped my head and I heard myself say in a child's voice, it's all I have. It never worked. But trying to shut my father out by clenching my muscles tight was all I had. I was choosing it. Once I made that connection, I could begin to let the body pain go unless we understand why we're doing, what we're doing, we are doomed to let the past drive our lives. I was pressured to attend a survivor meeting in San Francisco. I didn't feel strong enough to go, but I went. There were 30 people seated in a circle. There were 10 men rapists who had served their time in prison and were now mandated to attend these sessions. There were 10 mothers of survivors, no relationship, and 10 survivors, no relationship. Well, we all know what a man rapist looks like. He's big and mean and gruff. It's just that most don't look that way at all. This man was short, lean. He had on wireframe glasses and he said, I spent years in solitary confinement. And now I have a job at Kmart. And when I have a break, I have to find a small closet to stand in because that's the only place that feels normal to me. When he said that, I had such a profound insight, it literally physically threw me back in my chair. All of a sudden I understood what had been driving my life for 45 years. I was terrified to play the piano at my ninth grade graduation. I was terrified to give the commencement speech at our high school graduation. I was terrified to ski on the University of Colorado ski team, always skiing too fast in the downhill, much faster than my skill. But most of all, I was terrified to speak in front of five people, much less 5,000 people, and yet I chose motivational speaking as my full-time career just as the man had chosen 
a small closet to stand in because that's what felt normal to him. I had chosen terror because I had grown up in terror and terror felt normal to me. Once I made that connection, I could begin making different decisions. What scared me so much as a public speaker was standing up without notes. What if I forgot my next point? I wouldn't think of giving a presentation without notes. I will never choose terror again. I will never go in the ocean on a red flag day again. I spoke in Denver recently and after, people always stay to talk. A woman ran by, can't stay, can't stay, email. The next morning I went on my website and she said, I left feeling so overwhelmed. I'm a student at the Iliff School of Theology. Most students take 10 credits. I'm taking 21 credits. I have chosen to be overwhelmed because I was so overwhelmed as a child. I get it, I get it, I get it. Nothing about our childhood changes. What changes is how we think about it. And we can begin to change how we think about it when we make a connection between what we're doing and why we're doing it. Survivors ask, do I need to confront my perpetrator? I don't know. Each of us walks a separate path. I had to confront everyone. When I confronted my father, I knew he had a gun in his pocket and I knew he could use it. I didn't just spontaneously say, one day I'm going to confront my mother or my father. I thought about it for a long time. When, where, I even had notes when I confronted my father. So I knew I was saying exactly what I needed to say. Many survivors choose not to confront. It's a very individual decision. So many survivors begin their emails with, I just can't do this. I cannot work through more memories. I'm too scared. We're all scared. And we do it anyway. During my darkest days, my therapist said I would have to stop locking my bedroom door I was just repatterning the trauma. I have three locks on my bedroom door, nine locks inside my home, not lock my bedroom door. If I don't lock my door, I'll die. If you have never been raped or sexually assaulted, I don't ask you to understand that. I just ask you to honor the fact that that was my feeling. But I wanted to get better. And so that night, I left my bedroom door open. I jumped into bed for about 10 seconds, and then I locked my door. The same thing with the second night. The third night, I was determined. I locked myself into a tight fetal position, and then I literally watched the door all night long. I believed if I didn't watch my door, I would die. The fourth night, I was exhausted. I curled my body up into the tight fetal position, turned away from the door, and I said one of the most powerful sentences I have ever said to myself, if I die, I die. But I don't want to live this way anymore. In order to heal, we have to walk right in to the terror. Survivors ask, do I need to disclose? 
Yes. When and to whom? You're the only one who can answer that question, but disclosing can be incredibly freeing, as it was for me when I told my husband Larry, and years later, our daughter Jennifer. She was 13 when I told her, and she said, I don't understand, Mommy. Why are you ashamed? You didn't do anything wrong. And disclosing can be incredibly painful, as it was when I disclosed to my mother a year after my father had died. And she said, I don't believe you. It's in your fantasy. I needed my mother to look at the truth and say, I am so sorry. I did not protect you. Although I turned to my mother again and again in my late 40s, to her death at age 88, my mother never chose that path. My mother made a choice, and she did not choose me. When Jennifer was in eighth grade, we learned that one of her classmates had run away. All of a sudden, she was back, and everything was fine. I called the head of the school. I said, she dresses differently. She dyed her hair purple. She ran away. She is screaming for help. He said, I hadn't thought about that. I'll look into that. The following year, he left Denver to take over a larger school in a different state. And I literally felt called to disclose to him. I was always concerned about sexual abuse and children. I knew if I did, he would know I was bad, dirty, ugly, unlovable, and guilty. It's one of the most difficult letters I have ever written. Even more difficult to mail. I mailed it on Monday, so he would get it on Wednesday. So Friday, I began watching my mailbox. Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I was devastated. Weeks later, a columnist with the Denver Post wrote a column. One of their colleagues had been raped and they felt the best way to handle it was just to not talk about it. The reason she wrote the column was to say that had been the wrong decision. They should have told her how sorry they were and comforted her. I cut out the column, put it in an envelope with my name and address on it. I mailed it on Wednesday, so he would get it on Friday. So Monday, I began watching my mailbox, Tuesday, Wednesday. This is what I now know. This has nothing to do with me. I don't know whether he's a victim or a survivor or a perpetrator, but I do know this has nothing to do with me. After my story went public, I produced videos. One was to educate Boy Scout leaders, camp counselors, coaches. I called a Boy Scout leader and asked if he would give me his thoughts. I mailed it to him. I waited a week, two weeks. The third week, I called him. He said, the video is on my desk. I'm so sorry. I can't watch it. When I was nine, when you disclose, the person you disclose to may or may not be responsive because you're touching on their memories and their feelings. There's a survivor here tonight who emails me three to four times a day, every day, and has for months. And she is always apologizing about being so needy I was so needy 
when I was in recovery, I would say to Larry, do you love me? Do you still love me? Are you sure you love me? I don't know why he didn't say, do not ask me that question one more time. He would say, I love you every minute of every day. He emailed, emailed me a couple of days ago and he said, I love you so much my teeth hurt. A woman said to me once, you know the Lord never gives us more than we can bear. I wish she had told Margot Hemingway that before she committed suicide. Sometimes you are given more than you can bear. And that's when you reach out to a therapist, to Wings, to me on my website, to a friend. Reach out. Survivors write me about chaos in their biological families. My story was on the front page of the Denver papers six times. It was on every local newscast morning, afternoon, evening for days. My mother lived a mile away. My mother-in-law, whom I adored, lived two miles away. Mother was the only one driving. So if I wanted to have my mother-in-law for dinner, I had my mother for dinner. No matter what was in the paper that day, my father had a gun. Mother would say, your tulips are beautiful. The day I learned my father never stopped, mother said, your dinner is delicious. Weeks later, I was asked to testify before a Senate subcommittee in Washington, D.C., and some of my testimony drifted home. Mother called. She said, you said something that really hurt me. I thought, I can't wait to hear this. She said, you said your father pried you open. I said, I did say that, Mother. People are saying he molested me, and I felt I needed more vivid words. She said, please don't say that again. Survivors write about chaos with siblings. Recently, I was talking with one of my middle sisters, and we were talking about how our eldest sister, Gwen, had come forward publicly to stand by my side. She said, I would never have stood with you. I said, I know that, and I love you. Of the thousands and thousands of survivors I have been in contact with, I can think of only one family where all siblings came forward together. It just never happens. One child tells the truth, another denies, another minimizes, another has no comment. Too many survivors start with their email saying this, what happened to me isn't nearly as bad as what happened to you. It isn't what's done to us, it's how it makes us feel. When I was 12, my father laid on me and French kissed me. Never had I ever felt anything as yucky. I tried to shut off a feeling from my lower body, from my upper body, but when my father came into my face, I had nowhere to go. I felt as if he had entered my very soul. My father penetrated every part of my being, but this was the most traumatic for me. When I saw the movie Pretty Woman, I learned prostitutes don't kiss. It's too intimate. Last year, I read a story about a woman who grew up in a distinguished family, attended an elite college, and then became an intern at the White House. She had never had any sexual experience. President Kennedy established a sexual relationship that was often and intense. She even traveled on Air Force One with him to foreign countries. But he never kissed her. 
some people believe, if it isn't actual intercourse, it's not such a big deal. Yes, it is. And fondling can cause as much trauma as penetration. Those of you who have read my book know I back up everything with research. It isn't what's done to us. It's how it makes us feel. I may not remember what you said. I may not remember what you did. But I will always remember the way you made me feel. And even once can hurt for a lifetime. I'd like to begin to close by sharing with you one of my favorite stories. Irving Stone is one of my favorite American authors. He grew up in California. He never knew his father. They were so poor his mother worked two jobs, six days a week. But when he was 12, his mother began talking about a special Sunday they were going to have together. And when that Sunday finally arrived, she awakened him early, packed two sack lunches, and they boarded a train. He'd never been on a train before. They were going to Berkeley, to the University of California. He had never known anyone personally who had ever gone to a university. They walked through the big black wrought iron gates onto that magnificent campus, past the library, students coming in and out of buildings. He said when it was time for lunch, we sat in a little grassy area right in the center of the campus. And as I was finishing my lunch, he said my mother turned to me and said, you, my son, can come to this university. He said in her wisdom, she didn't say, you know, your grades aren't very good, or I don't have a nickel to help you. He said, no. She knew if she gave me the dream, I would find the way. Did Irving Stone graduate from the University of California at Berkeley? Of course, but his mother didn't stand in the kitchen and say, you know, I think he could go to college one day. No, she took him there so he could see it and touch it and know that it was real. What Larry and I needed most of all during my six years of recovery was to find just one woman who had survived the reliving of the memories and the feelings. Or maybe I would just always be this way, sobbing, night terrors, overwhelming anxiety, living in what Freud called hysteria. We never found her. I now am that woman. I haven't been in therapy for 28 years. I found peace and joy. When I was 53 and I awakened to find my story on the front page of the Denver Post, my worst nightmare had come true. Now everyone knew all the success and respect I had, gone. No one would ever look at me the same way again. That first day was just chaos. Late in the afternoon, I received a phone call from a friend, a teacher at East High School. I had almost forgotten I had agreed to be the graduation speaker for East High School. She said, I just overheard the superintendent of school say, Marilyn, should not have talked about this. I was right. I was unacceptable. I waited until five minutes before the graduation was to begin. The superintendent was seated on the dais. I didn't look at her. I didn't look at anybody. I just sat down and tried to focus. And then I heard a woman say, our speaker tonight is Marilyn Vanderbilt Atler. And with that, 3,000 people stood to give me a standing ovation. I was st 
stunned. I looked at the superintendent. Maybe I am acceptable. Standing publicly, this is who I am. Overcoming shame, our biggest issue is always shame. As many of you know, I always ask survivors to stand. I asked survivors to stand for several reasons. It was standing publicly that finally freed me from shame. I asked survivors to stand because there are always some people in the room who know this happens, but not to anyone at my table. And I asked survivors to stand for children. How can we turn to children? and ask them to speak of it if we haven't role modeled for them over and over and over again. If you were fondled once or many times, if you were sexually molested, raped as a child, as a teenager, a college student, an adult, by someone in your family, someone in the religious or educational communities, a neighbor, a friend, a stranger, however old you might have been, whoever your violator might have been, if you would feel safe in standing, or if you would like to take a major step in your recovery, would you stand now, please? Thank you for standing. If you made the decision to not stand, you made the right decision. You kept your boundaries. You didn't let anyone down. And finally, I would like to thank the support people who are here tonight, including my amazing husband, Larry, and our amazing daughter, Jennifer. Thank you for loving us, for supporting us. A support person said, how can I help? The little boy saw the elderly man next door sitting on his porch crying. His wife had died a few days earlier. The little boy walked up the steps and curled up into his lap. When he went home, his mother said, what did you say to Mr. Davis? And the little boy said, nothing. I just helped him cry. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do is to just help us cry. Thank you for inviting me.